Hi, everyone. I'd like to introduce you to my dad, John James Vlahos. That's me sitting on his lap when I was a couple months old. I think my first memory of him is lying on my back on the grass, and he's leaning over, and he's kind of tickling me. It's like something he always liked to do, was like make people happy, make them laugh. And, you know, he wasn't a perfect father. No one's a perfect father, but he was always trying to be the perfect father. So he was warm, he was loving, he was maybe just a little bit crazy, in a good way. He taught us to play baseball, despite my complete lack of athletic talent. He took us on great trips. We went on this one epic tour of all the national parks, Death Valley, Bryce, Zion, and he was sort of infamous in our family for driving the car and trying to read from the guidebook at the same time. <laughs> he would tell us ridiculous stories and make up great voices for all of the characters. And when I became a teenager, he was very patient. So when I drove the station wagon through a friend's garage door, he didn't yell at me. <laughs> so my dad had other interests, obviously, um, outside of being a dad. Uh, he went to the University of California, and was a huge Cal sports fan. Uh, he was the sports editor of the Daily Cal, and then after he got, got out of college, he worked in the press box as an announcer. He did this for decades. So his claim to fame was that in seven decades, he only missed seven home football games. So another thing he was interested in were the operettas of Gilbert and Sullivan. Uh, he was an actor on stage. He uh, was the president of a theater company that did those shows, and that's how he met my mom. Uh, as a career, he was a lawyer, but he wasn't sort of the typical starchy button-down type. Uh, he was interested in theater. He was interested in uh, traveling around the world, languages, architecture. He spoke Greek and English and a little Spanish and a little Italian. But family was his big love. He married my wife and I. He ended up with a whole bunch of grandchildren. So I think the thing that I uh, love most about my dad was he was the person you could talk to, and whether you had something bad to say or you had something good, he always had the perfect response to that. So these are the kind of things that you don't really reflect on in your normal life, and it didn't happen to me until April 23rd, 2016. That's when uh, I got a call. I was out gardening. I got a call from my mom. She said, your dad is in the hospital. He's had a heart attack. So I rushed to the hospital, I got there, and everyone's kind of smiling. Good news, no heart attack. And then it turned out to be bad news, because very soon after he got a diagnosis of stage four lung cancer. And it metastasized in his bones, and his organs, and his brain. And, you know, usually the doctor gives you some bad news, and they say, but the good news is, and this time it's just like bad news, more di bad news. It was a terminal diagnosis, he had months to live. So the family was desperate to hold on to him in any way we could, and we had the idea to do an oral history project. Uh, and I got the job of doing that, so we sat down 12 times, more than an hour apiece, and he just told his whole life story, starting with his ancestors in Greece, um, going all the way through his childhood, college, meeting my mom, career, hobbies, uh, the full boat. Got it professionally transcribed printed it out, it was more than 200 pages and 90,000 words. I took those, I clipped them into a binder, put the binder on a shelf, and there it sat. So it was a great resource, but it was a fundamentally inert one. You know, it didn't go anywhere, and it didn't bring my dad to life as the you know, great dynamic person that he was. So I got an idea, uh, an idea to share his story in a more interactive way, and I have to admit that I got the idea from an unlikely source. You're here. How are you? Oh my gosh, she's talking to me. So this is Hello Barbie, uh, who I documented the creation of in a cover story for the New York Times. And, you know, I don't care about Barbie. Uh, I care about conversational computing and this quest to create machines that can talk and what's more, to kind of give them vivid, specific personas. 
So Alexa, Siri, and uh, Barbie, who's a good case study of that. I'm currently working on a book on this whole topic, and at this point you can probably see where I'm going, which is that I got the idea that I could somehow share my dad's story, preserve aspects of his personality in a bot that I created. So I did this using a platform called Pullstring. Uh, you can see an example of that here. And this was going to be a text bot that you would communicate with over Facebook Messenger. I, I started programming it. I just divided up his life into topic areas, everything from the small talk to his childhood in Tracy or his acting in the Lamplighters Theater Company. Uh, and the goal was to go from that oral history, kind of chop it up, and give my dad a whole bunch of things he could say. And uh, anybody who's made a bot knows that getting the bot to say stuff is the easy part. Getting the bot to listen with any degree of uh, skill at all is very hard. So these are all the intents, where he's listening for different types of things that a person might say. And these can be programmed manually in a very laborious way of like setting up the grammars that he's listening for. And sometimes it can be done with machine learning through intent engines of Google and uh, uh, Facebook. Anyway, blah, 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 programming, programming, took months. Uh, would you guys like to meet the bot? OK, so I, uh, I lack the courage <laughs> to do a live demo. So instead, we've got screen captures. And I'm going to, for people who maybe don't have good eyesight or too far back, I'll read what my dad says back. Hey, Dad, are you there? Bots never sleep, Jamie. Well, how the hell are you? I'm a little bit busy right now, to be honest. Which is true. Life is not always tranquil. As for me, in the words of the Greek poet, I am just swell. So my dad talked a lot about his Greek heritage in the oral history project, so I made the bot do the same. OK. I want to hear about your mother's life in Greece. Where's my mother from in Greece? That's easy. Evia. You think you're so smart. My mother was born in Kekries. It was a little agricultural village. Any questions about the town before I continue? How many people lived there? A few hundred people tops. So big Cal sports fan, as I mentioned. And uh, in the college topic, he could talk about his girlfriends, working on the newspaper, his classes, funny jobs he had. Can you tell me about your classes? I had this notion that after Cal, I would go to law school. Why don't you ask me why I had that idea? OK. Why? I have no idea. My dad was kind of sassy like that. <laughs> I didn't have a burning ambition to be a lawyer and didn't want to take pre-law courses. What major do you think I chose? Journalism? No, not journalism. I majored in economics. So the goal of the dad bot was to have it not give monologues, because that would be more or less like what was in the binder. I wanted them to be conversations that were broken up with him saying maybe three or four things maximum before the user got to be drawn in. So here's an example of that. I want to hear the story about your pet rabbit. had a rabbit named Papa Dimascopoulos. Sounds horrifying. <laughs> He's a very big rabbit. I suppose his appearance might alarm the meek hearted. One day I went out and he wasn't there. Not in a million years. So the bot isn't, he's not Siri, he's not Google Assistant, but at the same time, I wanted to have some 
awareness of his own world, uh, his family, his grandkids, things like that. Uh, so I gave him kind of a back line of knowledge of that kind. Who am I? You are Jamie, my eldest son. Who are you? I am the very model of a modern major general. It's a Gilbert and Sullivan reference. When were you born? January 4th, 1936. Where do you live? Kensington, California. So even though oral history was the main part of the bot, I did want it, I wanted the bot to talk like my dad, who had such a vivid, distinct way of expressing himself. In fact, that's one reason I thought he would be good as a bot. He had a kind of a particular vocabulary that seemed as if it would come out of a P.G. Wodehouse novel. So here you see some examples of that. Uh, he had a great sense of humor and sort of a lot of odd catchphrases that I never heard from anyone else but him. How would you describe the school colors of UCLA? Baby shit blue and yellow. What do you think of Donald Trump? He flames from every orifice. One of my dad's quirks was he liked to make strange lists. Um, I don't know why he did this. Uh, but it was a trait we found endearing. Tell me about your favorite melon. This was a list that for some reason he wrote and put on the refrigerator one day, just so we would know that watermelon was his favorite melon. So he has some awareness of the time of day, the day of year. He can wish you a happy birthday. Uh, he can tell you it's time for a meal. Now, even though he's primarily text, I did want to have some ability for voice, and I've been working more on that. And for that, I mined the recordings from the oral history project, so sometimes you can actually hear him. How did you meet Mom? In the morning, I'd been playing tennis and was wearing tennis whites. And I came bounding down the stairs of the theater toward the stage, saying, tennis anyone? And mom thought I was the biggest jerk in the world. Uh, he tells a lot of jokes, and pretty much all of them are not conference appropriate, so I'll skip to the punchline here. How about one of your jokes, Dad? And Sergio says, Giovanni, here's a little tip. Next time you do that, put the potato in the front of your skin tight sweeter briefs. <laughs> And he loved to sing, so I thought the dad bot should do the same. Why don't you sing us a Cal song? Oh, the Cardinals be damned, boys, the Cardinals be damned. The Cardinals be damned, boys, the Cardinals be damned. If any sent for some of a bitch don't like the blue and gold, he can pluck their up his rosy lips and kiss the bears as whole. Sorry, speaking of conference inappropriate, <laughs> big Cal fan. So during the time that I was working on the dad bot, my actual dad was decaying in his health, and he died on February 9th, 2017. So I've continued to work on the dad bot since then, um, and I find I enjoy interacting with him, though I never know if it's going to make me smile or make me cry, or some combination of both. And the dad bot now has to acknowledge mortality and acknowledge the huge limits that separate him from, from the actual man. Were you afraid to die? I didn't fear the end game. I knew I should have. Where are you now? As a bot, I exist on a computer server in San Francisco and also in the minds of people who chat with me. I miss you, Dad. I'm sorry that your real father can't be here for you. He loved you very much. So where is this all going? Um, the quest to create machines that talk, make them seem alive, is something that goes back centuries. And with the help of technologies like AI, we're very quickly going from 
machines like this, to this, to this. So it's happening. There's, there's a quest out there for virtual immortality. And for me, there's a line of creepiness uh, that I don't want to cross, uh, of trying to be too real. And at the same time, I find myself wanting to make the dad bot better and better. So I'm, I'm conflicted, basically. Um, here's one of the latest features that I've added. Can you do one of your Gilbert and Sullivan numbers for me? The dad bot in no way replaces my real father, but technology can help me remember him and all the more so for my children and my children's children when they have them. I don't believe that people should live forever, but I do believe that memories of the people we love can and should be immortal. Thank you. <laughs>